Thank you for joining the BIS Innovation Summit. I'm Josh Lipsky, the director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. It is a pleasure and an honor to welcome back to the Innovation Summit today the president of the European Central Bank, Madam Christine Lagarde. President Lagarde, welcome back. Thank you so much. Very happy to join you. Wonderful to see you. I want to start today with a high level question. How do you see the transformation of money that is happening all around us? Has the speed of development surprised you, perhaps disappointed you? I think back to ideas you were offering five years ago about new technologies being transformative. Are we seeing that? Are we seeing enough of it yet? We are certainly seeing um, transformations uh, taking place at an accelerated pace. You know, I think that one of the consequences of the pandemic is that people have got much more used to digital means. And I'm not only talking about payment here. Uh, work became more digital, shopping became more digital, a lot of transactions of all sorts uh, have uh, turned digital by virtue of the fact that we were all stuck and, and locked down in various places. So if you look only at, uh, at payments, the total number of non-cash payments has increased by nearly 40% in less than five years' time. That's just to give you an idea. And if you ask, which we have done, European uh, area consumers what they would prefer in terms of, of payment, they generally prefer cashless means of payment. Uh, and this is about 50% of them. Only four years ago, it was a little over 40%. So if you start from what is the demand, what do people expect, what do they want? It is predominantly now a cashless payment. It is digital payment preferably, and it is transactions on internet. So if you combine these three, uh, there is a real push for those of us involved in payments, in currencies, in coins, uh, to actually go in that direction. So I, I want to speak a little bit about central bank digital currency, and we'll talk about the digital euro in a moment. Of course, the BIS and us at the Atlantic Council are doing in-depth research on this issue. I have our tracker project behind us. Do you think central banks are moving quickly enough, given the point you just made? And we think about the advancements that are happening side by side in the private sector. Chair Powell here in the U.S. often says it's better to have it right than have it first. Is that a sentiment you agree with? <laughs> I think that sentiment is changing uh, around the globe. But first of all, let's look at what we have. Thanks to your great tracker, we know that there are nine countries that currently offer CBDC. If you look uh, within the BIS at the number of central banks that are looking at CBDCs, uh, which have begun to do some research, do some uh, term sheets, um, weighs the pros and cons, it's nearly 90% of total GDP. More than 80 national central banks are actively looking into this. So I would argue that um, central banks have been a bit slow to begin with. But now there is real pressure coming from both uh, the customer base that we were discussing earlier, second, the competition, which we have seen in action over the last few years, and third, uh, public authorities. I think the fact that President Biden for the United States has signed this executive order asking players uh, and authorities to focus on this uh, is, is a good indication that, yes, there is urgency and uh, we, we, we need to, uh, to, to do real solid work to respond to the needs that are out there. So speaking of the needs that are out there, I want to talk about some of the trade-off when it comes to digital assets. And I'm thinking now about the crisis that is at front and center of all of our hearts and minds, the war in Ukraine. Is there a risk that these technological innovations can be used to avoid lawful actions like sanctions? And how do you, from a central bank perspective or from a broader regulatory perspective, think about those challenges? I try to think in, in distinguishing the categories of products that we're talking about here. So there's the CBDC, 
you know, central bank digital currency developed by sovereigns and that are probably the safest, um, surest and cheapest and most protective way of um, having, you know, a fiat currency that is guaranteed by the sovereign. Category one. Category two, you have the stable coins, which certainly are not as reliable that do not benefit from the guarantee deposit that um, are at risk of potential run, uh, a third of which has actually disappeared in the last few years, category two. And category three, which is the one that I'm most concerned about in the context of what's happening in, uh, in Russia, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, are the crypto assets. And they're not a currency. Um, they're not a mean, means of payment. But they are certainly being used, as we speak, Josh, as a way to try to circumvent the sanctions that have been decided by many countries around the world against Russia and a particular uh, and specific number of players, either individuals or corporates, which are obviously trying to convert their rubles into crypto assets. And here in Europe, uh, we have taken steps to clearly signal to all those who are exchanging, transacting, uh, offering services in relation to crypto assets, that they are being accomplice to trying to circumvent sanctions that are otherwise applicable to the number of people that I have referred to earlier. So is it a threat? Yes. Has it, I'm talking about the crypto assets here, has it been a threat in the past? Yes, because when you look at a lot of the dubious transactions that are taking place, a lot of the criminal activities, payments that are taking place, very often you find some crypto assets. Um, I won't mention any names, but we know what uh, we're talking about here. And when you see the volumes of uh, rubles into stable, into cryptos uh, at the moment, it is the highest level that we have seen that we have seen since um, May 2021, I think. I will double check the date, but it's 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 rising clearly. So I, I appreciate you breaking out the categories. I think that's so important because this often just gets grouped together in conversation and to talk CBDC versus stable coins versus crypto. So let's talk about CBDC and the digital euro project specifically now. And can you share with us the key drivers that led you and the ECB to pursue the project and where the status is right now of the digital euro? Sure. So here in Europe, and particularly in the euro area and at the European Central Bank, uh, we decided that we should move ahead studying CBDCs uh, about two years ago, a little over two years ago. And it was prompted by three things. One, customer's demand for the reasons that I've mentioned to you. Um, more non-cash transactions designed to go digital on the part of, of customers, and not just young customers, but also um, more experienced ones. So that was reason number one, customer demand. The second was competition threat. And it is known to all of us that when Facebook, now Meta, uh, decided to push the boundaries with its then uh, Libra, subsequently named DM, which has now vanished a little bit, that was regarded as a potential threat and uh, triggered uh, the desire to respond. And I think third, uh, the advance by some national central banks around the world with their project, and PBOC comes to mind because China was ahead of the game in terms of experimenting, in terms of piloting, in terms of um, structuring the, uh, the, the uh, CBDC. So with these three elements, uh, we decided that we couldn't just risk being behind the curve and we needed to go ahead and to move full speed ahead. So 
That means that for two years, we identified issues, we worked long and hard, presented the project to the governing council of the European Central Bank, that is the 19 central banks that form the euro area. Uh, they gave the go ahead to now really go into use cases, technology choices, uh, governance, uh, platforms, and, and that's what is going on at the moment. It started in October 2021. We think that it's going to be a two years journey before we can actually move to the last phase, which will be actually the experimentation and total implementation within the euro area. So we are on, we are on time, on budget, um, and uh, you know, the, dis the ultimate decision will be made by the governing council uh, to actually launch, but it's uh, it's heading in that in that direction. I would not prejudge that we actually do it, um, but but it's it's heading in that direction. Well, that's an exciting development. Of course, we all around the world will be paying close attention to the progress. I want to ask about stable coins, which you brought up earlier, and their relationship with CBDC, a digital euro. Sometimes this is framed as an either or choice. We're having this conversation now in the US. Do you see it that way? Or do you see a digital currency ecosystem that can coexist and be healthy with stable coins and central bank digital currency? Well, I, I don't I don't see it as an either or. I think that they can certainly coexist. And I think that from our perspective, CBDCs and, and sovereign currencies will not go. They will not go because they are the anchoring um, factor in the world of currencies. What matters is, you know, whether people have the confidence that a euro is a euro, or that a dollar is a dollar, or that a renminbi is a renminbi. If you have a stable coin, maybe there is a one-to-one -one conversion in from that stable coin, coin into fiat currency, maybe. And I'm saying maybe because we have seen instances when the regulator checked into whether or not there was this one-to-one -one guarantee, and there was not. Mm. And the assets against these stable coins were, that were out there, the assets against that were not tantamount the volume of stable coins that was in circulation. So there will be stable coins, there will be attempts and there will be desire by some to actually leverage uh, their respective networks or their respective platforms or their respective payment systems in order to uh, move into that activity. But I'm convinced that sovereign currencies in the form of CBDCs will necessarily at least coexist uh, with those, uh, those stable coins. And that will be so because they are the anchor, because they are associated with uh, safety, solidity, security, and benefit the confidence that is often associated with a financial national institution such as a central bank. Uh, th thank you for explaining that it doesn't have to be an either or choice. It's something I think that's important to discuss more and more. And there has to be a role for central banks as the issuer of the sovereign currency to also adapt to these technological innovations and harness them as well. I, I want to talk about privacy for a moment. So the ECB has identified strong privacy protections as one of the key features for a digital euro. The Federal Reserve said the same in their discussion paper last month. And as you mentioned, President Biden's executive order on digital assets also highlighted these issues. So my question is really about transatlantic cooperation. I know that a lot of work already goes on through the G20, through the BIS, of course, and other fora. Is there more that could be done between the world's largest central banks, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank, on testing, on experimentation, because there's so much mutual interest in designing these currencies with the right protections? Two points in response to that, Josh. The, the reason we focus a lot on privacy has nothing to do with um, European eccentricity or uh, exceptionalism, but it has to do with the desire that people have expressed when surveyed, when um, brought into the discussion. And what we have heard loud and clear 
in addition to their concern for safety, was their concern for privacy. They don't necessarily want the transactions to be anonymous. They can understand that because of anti-money laundering and uh, um, combating the financing of terrorism, there is a degree of intrusion. That is acceptable. So totally anonymous, no, not necessarily. But private and complete respect of their privacy, absolutely. That, that came actually as their first concern when we uh, consulted and surveyed um, client groups and, and focus groups. I think together with privacy, what a central bank can procure is the non-monetization of data. And I think that's a very strong distinguishing feature between stable coins provided by the Meta, PayPal and others of this world and this, the digital currencies that central banks can offer to uh, their citizens. Because central banks are not in the business of monetizing data. They can protect the privacy, they can protect the data of uh, those uh, that use central bank digital currencies. So that, that's for, um, for privacy. And I wanted to, um, there was a second point that you asked me about. Oh, no, I know. Cooperation. The cooperation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we have at the moment in the pure field of data is um, a degree of asymmetry between Europe on the one hand and the United States on the other hand. There is far more protection in Europe than there is in the United States. And I know that the, you know, the, the GAFA of this world uh, are not too pleased about, and they have lobbied extensively uh, in Brussels and in other places to try to reduce the level of protection to make you know, exchange of data much more fluid and without restrictions for the purpose of monetization. So asymmetry there. The beauty of a, an organization like the BIS is that it brings together all players in focus groups amongst people who really speak the same jargon and can focus on the key priorities. And I very much hope that thanks to the good services of the BIS, we central bankers can come together and have a sufficient common denominator in terms of respect of the privacy of our uh, citizens. I, I don't see why we wouldn't go there. I can see why the, the you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook of this world, Meta, um, would, would want to lobby against it. But central banks, I don't see it. No, that's, I think that's an important role the BIS plays in this, and we look forward to seeing them do more and more. And we at, on the U.S. side are encouraging the Fed to be even more involved, and they're already involved. And I think now that there's developments happening on the U.S. side and technological innovation, there'll be more of a model to bring to the table uh, to compare. I, I want to talk a little outside the technical developments, because you have spoken in the past about confidence in money. And I wonder mm -hmm. about how you approach people in the Eurozone who say, yes, we understand the outreach, yes, we understand the intent, but they still may not have faith or confidence as these innovations come. And how do you express what is happening in the transformation of money at a broader level beyond just the design features? I'll, I'll give you a, a very sort of practical down to earth example of what currencies mean and whether there is a symbolic force behind it, as well as a transactional value, uh, means of payment and all the rest of it. We are currently trying to help um, Ukrainian refugees access hard currencies like the euros. Despite the fact that their currency, the Rivnia, has no exchange value at the moment because convertibility has been suspended. So we see these um, refugees crossing the border from Ukraine to Slovakia, to Hungary, to Poland, to various neighboring countries with plastic bags full of banknotes. And the incred in incredulity 
that they have when they're told that they cannot exchange their hard currencies, which they think is associated with a real value, against a euro, is a vivid example of how much trust there is in cash and in a currency. It is the expression of sovereignty. It is, you know, all the three attributes that uh, money has. But it's, it's, you know, sort of mind-boggling to see how how much confidence there is there. So to those who say, oh, you know, there is a, a, a change of attitude towards um, towards cash, towards money, I say maybe, but I'm not so sure. Thank you for that. Uh, on the digital euro itself, I want to ask about the benefits you see in the future. Obviously, leading the European Central Bank, what are you thinking in terms of the possibility for monetary policy, or do you see it more as a fiscal tool, or is it both? Ah, um, we we are not we are not working on digital euro um, to have a new monetary policy tool. So that's. No, no. We are not working on digital euro to eliminate cash. No, no. Uh, we are working on digital euro because we believe that it would be, when it's operational, uh, faster, easier, uh, cheaper, more secure across the whole uh, Europe. You know, at the moment, we have 19 member states. There will be 21 in a couple of years' time when Bulgaria and Croatia join. Uh, so that that's really what um, what we hope for. That's I think uh, priority number one. At the moment, we know, for instance, that the Europeans are paying 1.4 percent of GDP for payment services. That can go down. Okay. Um, second reason: we want to make sure that central bank uh, money remains accessible. And as the world becomes more and more digital, we have to find a way for that central money, which is totally safe to be accessible. Third, we believe that the digital euro would safeguard financial stability and monetary sovereignty. By being ahead of the curve, we prevent other players, whether from the private sector or from another country, to take, you know, um, winner takes all advantage, if you will. And that's important. I think the fourth element, which uh, is also important, is that it would improve inclusion. Even in Europe at the moment, we have about 5% of the population which is not banked, which has no bank account and, you know, walks around with, with cash. That, that, for safety reasons, and particularly to protect women who are plenty in that category, I think is an inclusive uh, tool. And the fifth one, as I said earlier on, is to respond to the people's um, urge for protection of their privacy and security of their data. So those are the, the five key reasons. But no, no, to turn it into a monetary policy instrument, that's not the point. No, no, to eliminate cash, not the point either. No, th thank you for clarifying that. I think important and something we hear from central banks all over the world, and it's often a confusing point about the ambitions. So thank you for explaining the ambitions of the digital euro. Final question for you as we're short on time. I asked you at the beginning about sort of how we got to this point. I'll ask you at the end to look forward a little bit. Five years time, hopefully we're gathering together all in person for the BIS Innovation Summit. Where, where will the world be in terms of digital assets, in terms of central bank digital currency, if I could ask you to forecast a little into the future where you think we're headed. Five years time, I would say many of us will have completed the project, will be in a position or will have launched their digital currencies. Uh, we will have done enough good work so that those currencies are convertible easily uh, we will have worked hard on our payment uh, systems so that uh, transfers and uh, settlements can be orchestrated, organized in a safe, secure and fast way, faster than now, uh, both between central banks, between central banks and commercial banks, but also between customers and commercial banks. 
and that the volume of fees and and uh, and earnings by some will have declined to the benefit of better services uh, and um, and happier customers. Well, that is an optimistic note to end on. President Lagarde, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for your leadership on this issue and so many issues across the world. We hope everyone stays tuned for the next session related to what we just discussed. Does DeFi need sovereign money? Thanks very much.